Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. Hi, I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. This evening's edition will host legislative issues with Jim Parisi, where we bring the legislature into your living room. We hope you enjoy this edition of Legislative Issues and Labor Vision. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision, where we bring the General Assembly right into your living room. My name is James Parisi. I'm a field representative with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm your host this evening. Today we're going to be talking about a few education issues, primarily full day kindergarten, and what better person to have in the studio to talk about it than the Senate Education Chairperson, Hannah Gallo. Senator, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure to be here. So you were on the show a few years ago, but I always liked starting the show by giving people an opportunity to talk about their background, how they got in politics in the first place. And I know you've, you've been at the Senate for uh, quite a while now, well, almost 18 years, I think. So, it is, exactly. So what, what got you involved in, in politics in the first place way back when? Well, basically, um, it was an open seat, and I was um, interested. I've always had the attitude that rather than complaining about things, get involved and do something about it. Uh, don't be whining about it, get involved. And I believe in civic engagement and I think that we should all be civically engaged. And you've been successful in getting reelected all these years and I know you've uh, worked your way up the leadership chain and you're now chair of the Senate Education Committee. So what does that entail? What kind of uh, extra work or interesting <laughs> work uh, is it being a committee chairperson in the Rhode Island Senate? Well, I feel honored. Um, I'm very thrilled to be the chair of education. To me, it's the prime most important subject. Whenever you get to the base of anything that can make a difference in our world, in our community, it's education. That's how we are able to get out of poverty and to make something of ourselves and participate. And I, I think it's the answer to everything. So I feel a big, big part being involved in, as a chair of education, be able to um, see what I prioritize um, be important and help with that. And just so our, all of our viewers know, you, you work in schools. You're a speech language pathologist in Cranston. So you have a firsthand view on what goes on in our public Absolutely. schools. Absolutely. So a lot of times when, um, you know, I'll go to a conference and people kind of throw things out. I know what's true and what isn't true, mm -hmm. what's happening in the schools. And I'm right in there on the, you know, basement level making sure that, um, children are getting what they should be getting. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a speech pathologist. Uh, I make a big difference in children's lives and I find it very rewarding. Uh, a lot of people, you know, they talk about teachers and sometimes they're not part of the, um, the, uh, the schools. And being in there, I, I feel privileged that I'm able to work with our children and make a difference in their lives. It's very fulfilling. It's, it's good work and, and you're in, in your home district now of Cranston because that, that is one of your uh, districts that you represent, District uh, 27. Correct. Uh, you also have a piece of West Warwick? Yes, it? I do, mm -hmm. which has been very interesting. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, I wasn't thrilled with um, getting changed. You know, I, you get comfortable where you are, mm -hmm. um, but it's been an eye opener. Um, West Warwick is always, um, it is a needy community also and um, they're doing wonderful things there and it's nice to be involved. That's good. So you've been in the State House for a while as we've talked about and you've also been a champion of full day kindergarten for a long time I as have. well. <laughs> I don't walk into a room without somebody being able to say full day K and I can do a Yahoo, it's on its way. So yeah. I, it has been a pet project of mine and I've worked endlessly on it. What's your interest? What, what got you really focused on, on doing legislation for full day kindergarten? Well, a lot of it has to do, uh, well, there's many reasons, one of which is accountability. But if we're going to be accountable and making sure that students have what they need to graduate and to get jobs, 
they need to be able to read and have math skills early on. on. Um, the literacy skills have to be there by the third grade, I believe, or else you're setting up children for special ed and then possibly dropping out. And we know where that happens. And I think it's a whole lot more reasonable to invest in a child and in their education than to invest in prisons. At the end of the day, if we invest early, those children are more successful, they're happy students, they want to stay in school and they want to learn. So if we can do that for all children, I think we've met our goal. And we have a patchwork in this state. We have some communities that have offered full day kindergarten programs for years, and still we have some communities that to this day don't offer it. And you know what, it's true. We still, at this point, I'm, I'm sorry to say, we have seven districts that still do not have full day K, one of which is Cranston, which really makes me very sad. Um, Cranston as an urban, um, it, we, we have, um, different levels of need within schools and the urban being the most needy with the um, poorest children. And then we have ring communities and that's what Cranston is. But more and more, we have more needy children that are coming to school, not able to identify letters or spell their names. And those students mostly, all students will benefit from full day K. But those poor students that really don't have basic skills, they're at a disadvantage. And I think it's a crime not to give them the necessary tools they need to be successful. So my union's been working on this issue for decades as well. Back, yeah. back in the day, we worked with Governor Amund on getting districts a little extra money if they offered a full day program in, instead of a half day program. It's been that long. But the governor has a different approach this year, and it's something that you've been working on. Why don't you let our viewers know what, what the governor's plan is on full day kindergarten and how, how that coincides with all the work you've been doing? Well, I have to compliment the governor. Um, she sees education the same way that you and I see education, that it's necessary. And this year she has put it in her budget that all um, school districts must participate by um, next year, the year um, fiscal year 16, 17, mm -hmm. all schools should have full day K. She's putting money in the, her budget and um, Actually, um, it's, it's been coming along the last couple of years. We're getting more money um, into the funding formula, which is facilitating the full day K. I know you've worked on getting districts that want to plan uh, to have full day program, getting them some extra money. Plus, you're also working on having them not have to wait a couple of years <laughs> to get reimbursements uh, when that happens. I have. I, I've tried <laughs> everything I can humanly do to help with, um, with the funding and to facilitate the school districts being able to do it. Um, the money that you're speaking of was $250,000 that was put into the budget um, last year for startup costs. Unfortunately, the way the money um, was put into the budget, the school system would have to commit to um, hiring so many more teachers, and the $250,000 for the startup um, cost wasn't enough to entice the school districts because, unfortunately, the way Ride saw the funding, if you're a charter or um, a mayoral academy, and you're a K student, you get funded for full day K. Um, but in the public, regular public schools, um, they wouldn't be funded um, equitably so that the public schools could hire teachers to put the full day K in. Um, but that will all change. Every year I learn something new. <laughs> <laughs> and it has been about trying to entice the school districts to be able to um, support a full day K and have it within their budget and see it as a priority, um, which they all should. So you, you hope and hopefully expect that when the state budget passes this year, not only will there be some language mandating full day kindergarten by um, September of 2016, I guess it is, yeah. uh, but you also 
hope to see some issues related to how districts are reimbursed to help these seven districts that don't have programs right now that are full day. Correct, so that those students will be counted as full day case students. Um, that's my wish. I just hope that at the end of the session it goes through that way sure. and not be counted as a half time student because if we're if we need to pay to have those classrooms open and the students are there full time, I don't understand why Ride can't count those students as full time. It makes no sense at all mm -hmm. to me. That's how the education industry works sometimes, I unfortunately. Know. I think our viewers would be surprised to, um, to learn that it's actually some of our biggest school districts that are the ones that don't offer full day programs. In addition to Cranston, the city of Warwick doesn't offer a full day K. Which Coventry I'm doesn't offer a full day K universally. Right, on a, on a really big positive note, North Kingstown just voted within the last week or so um, that they're going to, uh, they got the money in the budget and they're going to do full day mm -hmm. K, which I, I find very exciting. Um, they've actually included me in their emails and I've been part of the process of following what they're doing and how it's going along and being a champion of full day K, I'm very <laughs> excited for them. Well, that's good. I know uh, I've had some exposure to Johnston, my hometown, um, another one of the districts that doesn't provide it. Uh, you know looking at it now because they know they're going to have to look at it. East Greenwich is another community. Of, yeah, Tiverton. There, there's East Greenwich, a very affluent community, wouldn't yeah. offer full day kindergarten for its I think its though, students. with East Greenwich though, um, most of those students are able to be able to afford to, I think if we looked into it closely, I'll bet most of those students are going to a private full day K, and that's what the issue is. Mm -hmm. Those who can afford it can do it, but those that cannot, you know, they can't, so mm -hmm. it's not a possibility for them. Yeah. And that's where the equitability comes in as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. When you look at your home district of Cranston, um, do your schools have room? You know, is there enough classroom space to accommodate the transfer from half day to full day? Some of the schools do, some do not. Uh, and they're looking at planning. They, we've actually had a committee meeting for the, like the last year. Um, our mayor supported it in a mayoral academy, so I know basically he does support a full day K. Um, the school has a committee that has been meeting regularly and they're looking at school space and it's my understanding that um, they're looking to put two on the east side of Cranston and two on the west side of Cranston this following year and then as you know to begin the implementation and then move from there. But not all the schools do have um, space, but there's other things that can be done. You know, I worked in South Kingstown, as you know, and they had all the um, preschool and full day K all in one location in one building, which worked out wonderfully. Mm -hmm. And they did a really nice job with that. So yeah. it doesn't have to be in each school, which is nice to have it in your local school. But at the end of the day, if you believe in full day K, you can make it work. Sure, and it, and it calls for a little creativity sometimes, but that's that's okay in order to you know, achieve an important goal. And, and providing a full day program for our five and six year olds really is an important goal. Well, and, and even beyond the literacy and numeracy skills and the socialization, I, there's a gazillion which I won't go into, but even, you know, moms and dads, they, two and a half hours is not enough time in the day. By the time you're dropping them off, you, you need to pick them up again. And so most of those parents need to be able to work and have a job. And so even on that end, it's, it's you know, it facilitates the family, I think. Sure. So as Education Committee Chair, you deal with a myriad of issues, not just the kindergarten and actually not just K-12. You also deal with some post-secondary um, issues as well. Why don't you take a moment and let our viewers know uh, about a couple of the different issues that are working its way through your committee that uh, might be of interest? Sure. So um, preschool, um, we are working on um, more funding for preschool because as you know, those uh, the viewers might not know, but a lot of students uh, from homes that don't have a lot of vocabulary and a lot of um, reading going on, those students are at a disadvantage 
And so uh, you need more better preschool programs. So we're looking at some funding for that, um, which there again, doesn't make sense. It's a full day uh, preschool, and then they're coming to a half day day. <laughs> but we are working on that, and those are for, um, they're in very needy communities, which um, we need to expand a little bit more. First, full day K, but then I would say the pre-K is also um, a very important issue. Sure. Um, we're also talking about music within um, the middle school. There's a bill right now in the Senate, and at this point, they're looking at getting ensemble, music ensembles in there and getting the principals to um, cooperate with that kind of information because it's a whole student that we're looking mm -hmm. at, um, not just your math and your English, it's you know all those other classes that help make a whole student. I know a lot of teachers and parents complain about the accountability systems in our public education that, um, that devalue anything that's not tested. So if it's a world language or if it's art or music, you know, things like that are really de-emphasized in our public schools because of this laser-like focus on, on I know. subjects that are tested. It's just unfortunate, mm -hmm. but um, so that's one of the bills. The other thing that I think is very important that's happening this year is SARA, which is a uh, reciprocity agreement for um, online classes for our colleges, and that's um, being promoted through NEBI, which is New England Board of Higher Ed, um, that I sit on, and it looks like we have something that's really gonna happen, and I think it'll be good for those people that have left their college degree and weren't able to complete it. Um, they can get a couple classes online and then get the degree. We've done some um, studies, and there are um, many adults that have not achieved their college degree, and it's not through any fault of their own. Um, life happens, and they're not able to finish it, and I believe this SARA agreement will help with that. And they'll be able to do that through the public higher ed institutions here in Rhode Island, right? Yes, absolutely. So yeah. I think that's a, that'll be a huge help. <laughs> and in our last uh, minute or so, the charter schools are always a subject matter of a lot of discussion and debate in the, in the General Assembly. And I know the House has had a focus on some education funding issues, but your committee's dealt with some of those same bills that are related to charter school financing and the way uh, the funding formula works. Um, what what, you know, what could well, you let our viewers know about what, what's really on the table, what's being so considered? So what's, what's happening with that, um, and the funding formula, we needed something, so I'm glad that that happened, but we're finding some faults within that, and there's equity issues so that, um, and a couple school districts like Cumberland is having some serious issues and Lincoln, we just had the hearing the other night. So that when you go into the funding formula, the basics, um, there are other things in there besides just the basic education. So um, the high cost special ed services that are paid through a regular um, Traditional public traditional, school. Traditional, that's it, I'm <laughs> sorry. Traditional public school. They are paying out $100 million. The mayoral academies, charter schools, have paid a half a million in this past year. So it's being put into the formula, and the charter schools are being, you know, that's incorporated in it, but it's not really as equitable as it should be. And there's many different issues like that. So I think. We need to look at the funding formula and try to tweak some of the inequities that are that are happening. But um, I'm glad that we do have a funding formula. You know, that was my first pet <laughs> <laughs> pet uh, that that I needed to take care of. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it needs some work. There's some communities that are really suffering with. Uh, the inequities that are happening. Sure, and any time you put legislative focus on an issue, um, hopefully we'll see some action. If not this year, hopefully real soon in terms of uh, fixing some of those inequities. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no more study committees, we're gonna do something about it. Sure. Well, Senator, thank you very much for your time. You've been very generous with your time coming into our studio. Thank you, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Day.
Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, thank you very much for your attendance here tonight on behalf of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. My name is George Nee. I'm, tonight I am the honor to be the chair of the board of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. And actually the first thing I'd like to do, if I could, is ask the board members of the Institute if they would stand up and be recognized. I told him I would not embarrass him tonight, but I said, I, but I'm going to. Uh, we have the uh, honor tonight of having one, the, the, the only original board member of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research, served on the board now for 35 years, Scott Malloy. So if you have any complaints, about the Institute, C. Scott. He's heard them all. Welcome to this terrific facility. We mention it every year because we should. This is a union-friendly facility built by the building trades men and women of our state with, from the beginning and with all the expansions. We, it's also the people who work here are all members of several different unions. IATSE, that's the International Association of Theatrical and Stage Employees, if you're gonna challenge me on that one. The SEIU, HERE 217, the Teamsters, UA 51, the Carpenters, the IBEW, and last but not least, and I saved them for last for a very special purpose, Labor's Local 271, which has just successfully organized 400 new union members, the dealers at Green River. So you can come here and enjoy it, park your car with a union member, go gamble with union members, and keep union members working. And that's why we come to these facilities. Just also wanted to recognize some of the people who came here earlier. Uh, Congressman Cicilline uh, joined us during the reception time. Also Congressman Langevin. Uh, our state treasurer, uh, Seth Magazina, was here, and uh, Senator uh, Juan Pichardo. If I missed anybody, let me know. I don't think I, I think I'm pretty good eye for that. So that's all I'm going to say for right now. We're going to save the excitement of who's going to be the MC tonight. And uh, with that, enjoy your dinner. And after that, we will start the program. Thank you again for coming. And before we begin uh, the, the, the uh, evening, we're all the festivities, and we've got a lot to do, and we're going to get through it all, I'm going to bring up Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Rhode Island Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for attending. I don't want to take much of your time because there's really a lot of important people here tonight, including Jimmy Riley, and I know his staff loves to boo him, so do it one more time. The... Uh, this whole evening, the work that the Institute does would never happen without a whole variety of people working together. Oftentimes at board meetings, many people on the board will make reference to the fact that they can't believe such a small group of people can do so many things. It doesn't happen just with the staff. It happens with a whole variety of people that will be introduced throughout the night. It happens with instructors for advanced and, and, and basic steward training, with teacher assistant, You'll be introduced later on this afternoon or later on this evening to the people in our English second language class who eat up that whole corner and the instructors that are with them and the staff people that lead them. You'll be introduced to people in this corner from Leadership for a Future and a whole variety of faculty and staff that make sure that that program runs well. And you'll hear these names throughout the evening, but I want to take a minute to do a couple of things. First of all, the Institute, you know, um, we had a fire in our building about a year and a half ago, and we thought, okay, six months we'll be back. Well, we're still in the building, and we're still working on tables, and we have not dropped any programs. We continue to do the programs, and we continue to add to them on a regular basis, and that's because of the staff. I want to take a few minutes now. I want to recognize the people on staff, and I'd ask you to stand 
Um, because I, 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 it's not often enough that we can take the time to say thank you to the people who really make a difference in my life, in the life of the board, and in the life of all of the people that we affect each and every day. I want to thank Roberta over here. Roberta Nelson, stand. I'd tell you what she does, but you'd be here all night. Over here, I want to thank Brady and Sophie. They are the coordinators of the English Second Language Program. In the back of the room, I want to thank Sylvia and Andrea. They are the newest additions to our family. And I can tell you, about two months ago, when we had a massive staff change and those two ladies came on board, it was the first time that I was really thinking, can we actually pull this awards dinner off this year? And I will tell you, we have the largest crowd we've ever had. Thank you. Thank you to everybody on staff. A couple of other people. We had an intern this year. Those books on your, on your table, the 35th anniversary, they look the same every year, but we do change them. And there's a lot of additions, and there's more than ever before. You will see the corporate sponsors and the union sponsors on each side. But on the screens, you'll see a rotation of all of the corporate and labor sponsors that we have. That booklet was put together by Kyle St. Pierre. He's an intern from RISD who's working with us. Kyle. Another gentleman that I want to recognize in particular, Paul Hubbard. He's around here with a camera around his neck. He runs the camera in the back, right over here. At 10.30 last night, Paul and I were doing some of the videos that you'll see a little later on tonight. And at one point, Paul said, I, I got to quit. I got to go to bed. Paul is responsible for running Labor Vision TV with John Colloy over here on a regular basis. Paul, thank you for the work that you do. The, um, the Institute would not be successful without the board of directors and you, George, recognized them earlier. I want to take two seconds and recognize them, but in particular, I want to recognize George Nee. Um, many years ago, when I decided to become the executive director, I had some real serious reservations about a decision I made about a month after. And George said, don't worry about it, we got friends. We got more than 370 friends tonight. George, you were honest, and you really do make a difference. Thank you. I, I want to I take one minute to talk about a few things that will not only tell my age and many of your ages, but this is the 35th anniversary of the Institute, and we really have come a long way. The Institute has survived a whole variety of changes. It moved three times. We recently had a fire. We've changed staff. We've changed board members. But the commitment of organized labor will always be strong and make sure it lasts another 75 years. We have strong union partners. We have strong partners in business and industry. And I can tell you honestly that we are getting stronger. We are financially sound. And we will continue to grow with your support. From all of the staff and all of the board, I want to say thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.
Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Good evening, my name is George Nee and I'm the president of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO and tonight we have a uh, very, very special guest uh, with us, uh, Mike Sabatoni, who is the president of the uh, Rhode Island Building Trades Con Construction Council. He's also the business manager of Local 271 of the Laborers and the business manager of the Rhode Island District Council. Welcome, Mike. Thanks for having me, George. Uh, Good evening. Very, uh, very uh, significant event happened uh, on May 6th, uh, as I understand it. Uh, the governor of our state, Governor Raimondo, came out to the IBEW 99 Hall in Cranston for a mm -hmm. kind of a town hall meeting with the members of the building trades to talk about her budget items that she believes will get our state back to work. Mm -hmm. um, can you just give us a little bit of a... Uh, thumbnail sketch of what happened that night and some of the issues she covered. Sure. Um, it was a great event. The governor had, uh, had made the request to, to do a, uh, a town hall uh, meeting with uh, tradesmen and women uh, in Rhode Island. Um, and uh, it was held at the uh, IEBW uh, local hall uh, training facility out in Cranston, which is a tremendous facility. Uh, and the theme of that, uh, that visit was to showcase and uh, bring awareness to uh, continuing investments in apprenticeship and training specifically in the construction industry since uh, we know that um, our industry is a big part, a pivotal part of uh, her economic proposal to get the state going again uh, with a lot of investments that uh, she's proposing in, the, uh, in her budget. Well, I know the governor has uh, made her top priority getting Rhode Islanders back to work and getting our economy back to work and she's been very uh, supportive and understanding of uh, the role of the construction industry in making that happen. Uh, from your perspective, what are, what are some of the highlights uh, in her budget and uh, how would they work? Well, the, the, the single uh, most important priority of the building trades uh, in the construction industry for the last uh, few years has been to uh, deal with the moratorium on school construction uh, in the state of Rhode Island. As we know, uh, schools are in awful shape ac across the uh, state, especially in the urban corridors of, uh, of Rhode Island. Uh, and uh, you know, the worst thing that we've done was to continue to defer much needed repairs and maintenance on these buildings um, over the last few years. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's really one, one, of the, one of the most important things that we can do to not only uh, make an environment for our young, uh, young people to, that's conducive to learning, you know, we, we always uh, showcase the importance of education, but yet we send them to, uh, uh, to uh, places that, uh, that don't really show uh, that commitment to education uh, by, the, by the condition of the, uh, of the, of the buildings. So uh, not only would we repair that, but uh, you have immediate impact on the economy by putting back uh, to work tradesmen and women who have been severely impacted with the economic downturn as far back as 2008. Uh, and, you know, Rhode Island has still yet to come out of that uh, economic downturn, even more specifically in, in construction. We, we average I have been averaging uh, as high as 40, 45 percent unemployment in the trades in Rhode Island. You know, uh, maybe just a side uh, note, uh, tell people uh, about that uh, young lady that uh, wrote you the letter from Roger Williams School and how the governor responded. Uh, that makes for, it's kind of an interesting story and we participated in yeah, it. Yeah, we had the opportunity to visit the, uh, the Roger uh, was Roger, Roger Williams Middle School, Roger in Providence. Williams Middle yep. School in Providence, uh, and uh, it was an outreach from a, from a young lady who was doing her internship from Providence College, helping with a program called Generation uh, X that uh, takes on uh, some civic priorities uh, as a test case and a learning uh, scenario. For this happened to be a seventh grade class, and they reached out to me in my capacity as president of the building trades and uh, asked if I would come address their uh, their class. Uh, because their priority was to remove the school uh, building moratorium so that they could fix the school uh, that, uh, that they currently attend. And I thought, uh, you know, what a better way uh, to actually use uh, to, uh, to bring awareness 
to, uh, to the issues than having a seventh grade class reaching out to people such as myself and political leaders uh, to say, you know, this, this is so important that seventh graders are taking notice that, uh, that they need to fix uh, their crumbling schools. And I was fortunate enough, uh, the email also said if you have any other uh, influential uh, friends or, uh, or colleagues, uh, bring them along. Uh, so uh, I reached out to, to the governor's office and, and, uh, and see if she, she would be able to possibly uh, attend uh, as well as yourself. Uh, and uh, Mary Beth Calabro from the Teachers Union and Frank, uh, Frank Flynn as well. And uh, I think it was a, a very good uh, visit. Uh, so appreciative to see the young kids. Uh, and, uh, and again, just to bring awareness of, uh, of what we're trying to do and the actual impact it has on seventh graders. Yeah, it was quite an event. The, uh, the governor stopped by and actually sort of taught the class. And I remember that uh, she asked them, look, now that you're engaged in this issue, I'm going to come back. I'm going to give you the address of the speaker and the Senate president, and you should all write a letter. Yes. So that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that started from one email from somebody. That's so right. That that's was right. Uh, kind of a, uh, a remarkable event. And, uh, it really was. Good job getting everybody there. Yes, it was. You yes. must be an influential guy. Well, <laughs> I was outranked that day, both oh. by yourself and by the <laughs> governor, no, no, but no. that's okay. Uh, one of the, uh, I think, very uh, creative and innovative ideas uh, that is in this budget um, is a sort of a joint effort with our uh, treasurer, uh, new treasurer Seth mm -hmm. Magaziner, and the governor um, uh, of the creation of an infrastructure bank that will also impact the schools. Uh, and, and so maybe just give us a few highlights of, of what you know about that mm -hmm. and how you think that could be beneficial. Yeah, and then this program will leverage already existing funds to leverage more uh, appropriations of some leftover uh, funds. Uh, that, uh, that have not been spent uh, to create uh, the opportunity to green up uh, public buildings uh, as well as even some residential buildings but mostly uh, public buildings and uh, um, which again uh, is something that's, that's, that's extremely important. We have some of the highest uh, costs of energy in the country here in the Northeast and a lot of our building stock uh, is not uh, energy efficient. So. Uh, you know, puts immediate people back to work, building tradesmen and women, constructing these projects and retrofitting these projects, and it also reduce uh, the overall cost uh, to uh, heat and cool these buildings uh, due to the conditions that they're in. You know, I happen to live in the Northeast, and uh, we've been around a while, so our buildings tend to be a lot older than uh, yeah. other areas of the country, and we have difficult winters and you know hot summers, so. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a way to, uh, uh, to leverage funds and do something that's in the immediate appropriate for putting people back to work and the long-term uh, impact that it has on, uh, on our emissions as well as our, uh, our cost of, uh, of, uh, of energy. Well, I think it's also uh, very creative in that one of the uh, possibilities uh, is to uh, provide some retrofitting to, for example, nursing homes to mm -hmm. get a lot of their money from the state yep. and are, again, older buildings. So not only is it putting people back to work to get them retrofitted, but mm -hmm. then over time the state's going to have to spend less money on the reimbursement system to the nursing homes and the same mm -hmm. thing with the cities and towns. So it's uh, a pretty creative uh, a project from, uh, from what I've seen. And I also... Uh, felt that they did a very good job, as I understand, of going through the budget and going through the areas where we had we had federal money that was sitting there. That's correct. That hadn't been used. And that, just mention that for a minute, because that during our, it's crazy that we weren't using this money. Yeah, uh, believe it or not, from time to time there is money that uh, that uh, we uh, haven't found the purpose for yet to, to to utilize. So this will use existing monies. I believe it's uh, two million dollars of uh, of maybe even leftover ARA money. Uh, um, and will um, uh, will then leverage, from what I understand, about thirty million more dollars to uh, to, to get this program uh, up and running. And the other uh, thing that I think is a, is a smart move by both the uh, the treasurer and the governor is to use and and build upon the success of the Clean Water Financing Agency as the model and the conduit uh, to implement this program, which we know has been a tremendous success for the cities and towns in dealing with their uh, their clean water issues. Good. Just uh, take a minute before we go into a couple of other issues. What, what was the, uh, you know, uh, you know, your your folks, the building trades uh, brothers and sisters, have you know had a you know, three or four or five six tough years. Mm -hmm. um, what's the mood right now uh, of the of of that uh, of that event, that town hall? Do they feel optimistic? Do they mm -hmm. think things are starting to turn around? Uh, I will. Uh, I would describe the membership as anxious, 
but optimistic. Uh, I mean, uh, optimism is definitely in the air. Uh, we were uh, big supporters of, uh, of Governor Raimondo through her campaign uh, for uh, exactly what we're speaking about tonight on these initi initiatives that will get our members back to work, uh, that we are part of the solution. You know, a vibrant construction economy lends itself to an overall vibrant economy. Um, anxious because it hasn't happened quick enough, as we know in neighboring states, Massachusetts and, uh, and Connecticut are, uh, are, are, are bustling uh, and Rhode Island has lagged behind. So we believe that all of these, uh, all of these incentives in the article, uh, the budget articles, uh, are, are pieces and, and tools for us to get the, get the economy going. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, we believe that we're on the cusp of, uh, of that happening. Well, before we wrap up, do you have uh, any other uh, specifics you want to mention? Any uh, things that jump out at you as possible, as real strong uh, articles in this budget that will help us? I, I, like I said, I just think that they all come together. You know, there's not one single uh, thing there that I think will solve the issues. I think it's a combination of, uh, of, of all of them and having the tools in the toolkit, to use a, use a phrase uh, yeah. from a billing trade guy, yeah. uh, that will uh, give the, the state options uh, that it can use when necessary to make sure that we, we get the economy going. Uh, and I do think that uh, the perfect person for the job is the new uh, Commerce Secretary and Stephen Pryor, who is extremely well versed in how these things uh, intertwine and how to utilize them uh, to, uh, to get the, the, the Rhode Island's economy going. And I'd also just like to commend as well the leadership of, uh, of Speaker Mattiello and Senate President Piverweed, who uh, uh, first blush have been supportive of most of these things. I know obviously there'll be some tweakage to the budget. Sure. But I think, uh, you know, with, uh, with their leadership and working uh, together with, uh, with Governor Raimondo, uh, I think that's why you see uh, anxious optimism from, uh, from my members. Well, I know that, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned the Speaker and the Senate President, because I think they have set a course over the last couple of years to try to, you know, make this state uh, a more business-friendly state, which from a labor yep. perspective is a good thing, because we want businesses to thrive, because that's where our people work. So they've got the ball rolling, and I think now there is a partnership that we haven't had in a long time where we see the political leaders working together. So yep. that's... I think that's to our benefit for everybody. The only solution to the problem is a vibrant economy, whether you're in business or labor, whether you're a public employee or a private employee, uh, whether you're a mayor, a town administrator, a rep, or a senator. Uh, the only thing that solves uh, the universal problem is a vibrant economy. Without that, uh, everybody's pretty much got the same issue uh, <laughs> and, uh, and difficulties. Well, I think that's also part of uh, the, at least the, call that she has sent out that we need you know x number of good middle yeah. class solid jobs which means good wages good benefits a good yep. pension plan Absolutely. because that's what we need we don't need just a job because we've got some of those but they don't really get our economy going no and and, you know, and i think uh, history shows us the only time where where we really uh, make a, a a an impact uh in the in a state is when uh, or, or on a project or an endeavor is when business, uh, labor, and the public officials come together, and, and that's when good things happen. I think that's a great way to end this uh, show tonight. And, well, I appreciate uh, your time, you know, and I appreciate, appreciate you having you me. coming in and, uh, you know, everything you do to keep this uh, state moving forward and representing your members. You've done mm -hmm. a wonderful job over the years, uh, and it, it's noticed because, you know, just that one student at Providence College That's knew, right. knew who to send a, an email to to That's get something right. done. And I appreciate all the support of, uh, from yourself and the, uh, the AFL-CIO. You know, you work tirelessly on, the, uh, on behalf of, uh, of all working men and women, and not just union workers, but all. And, uh, you know, it's a pleasure for me to work with you, and I appreciate you having me. All right, good. Thank you. Take care. We have heard the labor perspective on the governor's budget. Now let's listen to the governor in her own words speaking recently at the IBEW Local 99 Training Center. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It's great for me to be here, and you were very supportive in the campaign, and I appreciate that. And I'd like to think you did that because you knew you could trust me to work as hard as I can to get jobs into Rhode Island and to put your families to work, to put you and your families to work. And that's exactly what I'm doing. That's exactly what I'm doing. You know, I bet a lot of people in this room and your, your brothers and sisters who aren't in this room haven't been as busy as you've wanted to be 
in the past two, three, four, five years. You know, it's a fact. It's true, right? Right? You spend a lot of time wanting to work, and there's no jobs to work on. And when you're not working, you're not getting paid, you're not paying into your health care, you're not paying in, and that's not the way it should be. So my whole mission as governor is to focus like a laser on getting this economy going again. And that starts with rebuilding the state of Rhode Island. Because when we, when we rebuild things, you get a job. And the unemployment rate in the trades is still, how high is it? What, 20% plus? 40 and some? It's ridiculous. And there's no excuse. So let me tell you what I'm going to do. Let me tell you, I, right now, I have a proposal in front of the Rhode Island General Assembly. And it's designed to do three things. Put shovels in the ground and cranes in the sky. Lower the... Lower the cost of doing business and make it easier to do business in Rhode Island and train people. We got to get good skills, including apprenticeship programs. So the first thing we're going to do, I have a big program right now which will provide real estate tax incentives. So we have some commercial real estate, so we have commercial building going. It makes me sick to my stomach when I'm downtown Providence versus downtown Boston. Downtown Boston is a boom. Downtown Providence is not. So every commercial real estate developer I talk to says they're ready to build, but because our economy is so depressed, they need a little help. So I think we should give them the incentive they need to get the buildings going, which puts you guys to work. That's what we got to do. Those are called rebuild Rhode Island tax credits. We also have a jobs tax credit. I want, you know, give tax credits to companies to basically give them some incentive to add jobs. I want companies to come here and build here. And when they come here and they add jobs here, we'll build things here. It's so important. Uh, second thing is we got to make it easier and cheaper to do business. You know, the reality is a lot of people, companies, don't want to add jobs in Rhode Island because they think it's too tough of a place to do business. And we got to change that perception. Uh, so one of the things I'm proposing is right now Rhode Island's one of the few states in the country where we actually tax businesses on the amount of electricity that they buy. We got to get rid of that because companies won't, don't want to be here if we put that burden on them. And if they don't want to be here, they're not employing people here. Um, so we have to do that. I also have a huge proposal for the 195 land. So you probably know we rerouted the highway. There's a couple dozen acres in downtown Providence. I want to use that land. I want to have uh, all every square inch of that land should be to create jobs. So I have proposed a $25 million fund to kickstart development on that land. Listen to me. If we do this right, they did a program like this in New York City. They had Roosevelt Island. Roosevelt Island was just like 195. Piles of dirt on the ground. And New York City came in there. They put some money on the table. The government said, we want you here. They brought together colleges and universities with companies. And they, they have a booming campus. And you know what happened? The first, you know the first people that get put to work when we build these things? You guys. The building trades, iron workers. They are building a huge applied sciences campus. You know what it takes to build a campus? Iron workers, plumbers, pipe fitters, painters, laborers. It's about electricians. Come on, help me out. I don't know how to build a building. That's your job. <laughs> Laborers, there you go. Look at me. There you go. <laughs> Roofers. Every one of these buildings needs a roof and needs sheet metal and drywall. Come on. What do you need? Bricklayers. Thank you. You're leaving me hanging on that. <laughs> but I'm very serious about this. It's not magic. I got a plan in front of the General Assembly right now that'll make this a reality for you and your families. Also, I've proposed a school building authority. A school building authority. 
I went the other day, Michael and I went to Roger Williams Middle School in Providence, and it's falling apart. There's paint falling. It was pretty sad to see the conditions these kids have to go to school in. As a mother, I have two kids in Providence Public School. No kid should have to go to school in a school with the paint peeling off the wall and the ceiling about to fall on their head. So I propose this year we put $90 million into school construction and do even more next year so we can rebuild our schools, do the right thing by our kids, and put you guys to work. And then the last thing I have in there is an infrastructure bank, uh, kind of a green bank. You just, Mike just talked about uh, renewable energy and, and um, uh, energy efficiency. So this is a program we're going to put in place so that we can have money available to do ener deep energy retrofits of municipal buildings and companies. And what we're going to do is we're going to get a lot of banks to come to the table to lend money to companies and cities and towns to do this uh, energy efficiency work. Uh, so if we do all these things, no one of these things is enough to move the needle. And that's why I put in a package that has five or six different pieces, because we need it. We need it. We don't need a little bit of change. We need a lot of change. We need all of it. The 195 land, the jobs credit, the real estate credit, the tax increment financing, the school building authority, the infrastructure bank, we need every bit of it and then some to kickstart this economy. That's what I want to do. This is like to ignite the, the comeback that Rhode Island needs. Everywhere I go, I say to people, get on board with the comeback. Because we've been down on our luck for too long. And we've got everything we need to make this comeback happen. The last piece of the jobs plan is to train people. The reality, and you, you do this better than anyone with your apprenticeship programs. Look, here's the reality. People need skills to compete in this workforce. So I have a program to provide uh, college scholarships. I happen to believe every kid that comes out of a public high school in Rhode Island with a good, good grades should be able to go to college even if they don't have enough money to go. So we're going to start a scholarship program to pay for that gap. I also have a program I'm rolling out so that kids can take college classes while they're in high school. Too many kids go to CCRI and, don't, and drop out. And they drop out because they have to work two or three jobs while they're there. And it takes too long to get their degree. So if they can get half of their degree in high school, then maybe they can get their associate's degree in only six months or a year. The goal for all of this is to make Rhode Island a place of opportunity. That's all we really want, right? People just need a chance. So that's my job. My job is to make Rhode Island a place so that every hardworking family has a chance. Show up on time, ready to work, and you ought to have a chance to have a good middle class life. And right now, that's not what we have in Rhode Island. So I'm going to do everything I can to get every single bit of this jobs plan passed. Because times are too tough. The people of Rhode Island are depending on us. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.